Hi there, my name is Janet Gertler and I have the pleasure of interviewing for a pre-recorded interview Judith Clark who is the author of Under the Radar and this is part of the online reading series sponsored by the Rosé Foundation. Judith Clark is a playwright, a novelist and an indexer. After receiving a Master in Library and Information Science she worked as a children's and young adult services librarian before taking on several roles with a library automation company, including Knowledge Systems Coordinator. She is a member of the Indexing Society of Canada. Her past writing credits include two plays, American Women, performed in Sage Theatre Ignite Festival in 2006, and Code Burgundy, commissioned by the Petro-Canada Stage One new One Act Play Development Series 2007. She has also published romance under a, a persuadum with a small press in the United States. Pseudonym, my goodness, I'm a writer and I said it wrong. When she isn't writing and indexing, she explores rural Alberta, reads compulsively, bakes apple tarts, dreams of sailing on a tall ship and wishes that she had a horse. Sadly, Calgary bylaws don't even allow chickens and the backyard is too small. Under the Radar is her first young adult novel. And I must say, I enjoyed reading your novel very much. It's a very strong characterization. I thought you did a wonderful job with it. Um, I think what we're gonna do today is we're gonna hear you read the first chapter and that will give everyone a really good sense of who the main character is and the kind of what, what he's set up for himself in the novel. And I'll read a little bit about what the novels about and then Judith you can, you can take it away with your reading. Okay. So under the radar, one more year. That's all Gunner has to wait until graduation. More importantly, it's one more year <laughs> until he'll feel safe to come out. Gunner has kept his sexuality a secret. Only his twin sister knows he's gay. Coming out now would make him the target of homophobic bullies at his school. But a year is a long time especially when life starts moving at its own pace and Gunner meets guys he wants to date. Set in rural Alberta, Under the Radar is the uplifting story of a teen who dreams of a life in which he can be himself. And before you read, I, I must say that I really loved the, um, the characterization, I mentioned that before, and I also loved how you incorporate Alberta right into the story. It's a very um, contemporary book, and I think the fact that we've got rural Alberta and some of the cities that we know in Alberta, Medicine Hat and Calgary as part of the story. It just makes it a little more exciting and fun for Canadians to read. So let's hear you read the first chapter. I'm just gonna disappear off the screen and we'll hear. Okay, um, so I'm going to read the first chapter, chapter one, and it is entitled Somewhere Under the Rainbow. On Sunday afternoon, I did bicep curls in our walkout basement while I waited for my friends to show up. I wondered if they'd heard about what happened at the party. My stomach fluttered. My little brother Tor sat on an old beanbag chair in the corner playing a game on a tablet. The last thing I wanted was for him to listen in. Nick and Jason are coming over, I said, hoping he'd take the hint. So? He didn't look up from his game. Every time my twin sister Ellen and I thought he'd hit peak pain in the ass, he exceeded our expectations. If I gave him the smallest sign that I wanted him to get lost, he'd make a point of sticking around. I let it drop. He'd get bored and take off eventually. Bang, bang. Mix usual, I'm here, courtesy knock. He threw open the heavy back door and entered gym bag hanging over one shoulder. Hey, he tossed it onto the battered couch near the door and propped himself against the wall to take off his shoes, pausing long enough to brush his curly, dirty blonde hair back from his face. If he let it grow too long, he looked like a poodle. Jason followed Mick inside. Hi. He towed off his shoes, put them on the heavy rubber boot tray and stowed his stuff under the row of sturdy coat hooks. Then he crossed to the wrestling mat and started stretches. Mick dropped onto the couch. Dude, you didn't text. 
they had heard. Mom has my phone. Locked in dad's desk all weekend. Dinner table infraction. It was just one text. I didn't know she could see me from the kitchen. Yeah, sucks. So, tell. I racked my dumbbells and draped my hand towel around my neck, stalling for time. Nick leaned forward. I heard Carrie Van Pelt started grinding on your crotch. Whoa, whoa, whoa. She sat on my lap. She's grinding. No way she isn't. Jason looked over my shoulder, and I didn't have to follow his gaze to know Tor's eyes were huge. I just hoped he could keep his mouth shut. So she's grinding on your crotch and lays a lip lock on you, and you make her stop? She was wasted. And your point is? Dick, move. I pulled my sweatshirt off and tossed it aside, revealing the old t-shirt underneath. Are you kidding? If Carrie Van Pelt wants to kiss me, I'm not stopping her. I jumped to my feet. I can spot somebody. Who's first? Mick held up a hand. Dude, deets. I wasn't going to get out of this, so I sighed and dropped back down on the mat. Brody was trashed, and he was doing his usual wrestlers or pussies, football players, real shtick. And Ryder was goading him on the way he always did. Ryder loved starting fights, as long as it was someone else getting punched. And then Carrie came over. Laughter and squeals and camera flashes put me on alert. Carrie Van Pelt headed toward me, weaving and staggering across the big backyard, accompanied by her giggling entourage. Before I could escape, she straddled my lap, clamped her mouth to mine, and pried at my lips with her tongue. I stood, attempting to disentangle myself from her without dumping her on the ground, but she draped an arm around my neck and hung off me. Why don't you want to kiss me? So that's when things started with you and Brody. You made Carrie stop and he called you a fat. Nick cut the word off with a glance toward the stairs. If mom was close enough to hear him from upstairs, he'd be in deep shit. No, I said, wondering who had told him about the F word. Brody told Carrie he'd kiss her and then he grabbed her and started macking all over her. Carrie shoved Brody hard and he staggered back his sense of balance long gone. Some of the guys standing around laughed. He flushed in anger and lurched toward Carrie. I got between them. Leave her alone. I told him to stop and he took a swing at me. I parried his wild hook easily, snapping a straight right into his solar plexus. Fastest way to end a fight. He went down, gasping like a fish on land. A second later, he was spewing all over the grass. Dude, seriously, you need to kick Brody's ass. He's always calling you. Nick glanced at the stairs again. You know. This kind of conversation was exactly what I was trying to avoid. I didn't want to lie. I didn't want to deny who I was. But I wasn't ready for this. What could I say? He says that about anybody he doesn't like. Well, that felt a lot like lying, even though it wasn't an outright denial. Jason rolled to his feet. Maybe he should be telling everyone that Gunner's a good guy who doesn't take advantage of people who are shit-faced. And Gunner did kick Brody's ass. One punch, said Mick. One punch is not an ass kicking. If I kick Brody's ass, Mum will kick mine. That was so obviously true, it stopped the discussion. I didn't dare look at Tor. He had major dirt on me now, and the more casual I could play it, the less blackmail power he would think he had. I didn't really think he'd screw me over on purpose, but Tor does his worst damage by accident. Jason took off his sweatshirt, retrieved hand wraps from his gym bag, and perched on the end of the couch. I'm starting with the heavy bag. He hooked a loop over his left thumb, hand splayed, and began wrapping. My shoulders relaxed. I'd tensed up without realizing it. I jerked my head at Mick, 
Come on, let's go. Mick sighed, heaved himself to his feet, and hopped on one leg to pull off his track pants. Underneath, he wore Valgard Vikings wrestling shorts like me and Jason. Official wrestling practice wouldn't start until mid-October, but the team would be doing conditioning at phys ed. Mick, Jason, and I had wrestled and sparred and worked out together all summer. Lifting and boxing built the kind of stamina you needed for wrestling season. When I started at Valgard High, coaches tried to convince me to play football or rugby or even basketball, but my big brother Gary and his best friend Sam were wrestlers. And Mr. McKinnon, the wrestling coach, was the only coach who didn't give me shit about my hair and phys ed. He just said, if I wanted to be on the team, I'd have to wear a hair slicker. I liked wrestling because you're on a team, but your battles are your own. Coach Mack talked about the mental game, and some guys believed that meant psyching out the competition. I thought it meant not letting your head make you lose. That's the real battle, the one with yourself. Mick didn't try to talk during his reps, and he didn't expect conversation while I did mine, which was a relief. Finally, we all stopped for a break, poured glasses of water from the pitcher in the beer fridge, and collapsed onto the floor. Tor's chair was empty, just as well. He already knew way more about last night than I wanted him to. I thought Carrie had a boyfriend, said Mick, so why was she climbing all over you? I groaned. Ugh, can we not talk about this? He's irresistible, Jason winked and stage whispered. It's the hair. I flipped him off and he laughed. My hair is honey blonde with highlights from the sun, heavy, thick, and straight down to my shoulder blades. Last night, I had ponytailed a fistful at my crown with a couple of braids on each side and the hair and back left loose. Kind of like Orlando Bloom playing Legolas, except I've got way more hair and mine is real. Girls really go for my hair, which is ironic when you think about it. I can't believe Brody swung at you, said Mick. He must have been wasted. He'd had more than a few, but he wasn't blackout drunk. More like envious and mean with it. People like Brody don't bully others because they feel strong. The louder the talk and the bigger the swagger, the smaller they feel inside. And with his buddy Ryder right there egging him on, once he started, he couldn't back down. It felt good sitting here with my best friends. For a second, I had a crazy impulse to just tell them, guys, I'm gay. But wrestling was the only thing I was looking forward to this year, and I couldn't risk it being awkward. I just couldn't. There's enough potential humiliation built in already, like your body making embarrassing noises or smells. The worst is a hard on in a match. Any guy can get one. Dick malfunctions are no picnic in practice, but in a match that people are recording, the total strangers can see that your parents might spot. There's a just let me sink through the floor moment sooner or later for everyone. Right now, I'm just another guy on the team. No one thinks twice about all the sweaty groping on the mat. But the second I'm out, all that could change. Being out would be a relief for about one minute. And then everything would go to hell. I would just keep my secret for now. Oh, great. I am back. That was really, really well done. I love the way you read that. Um, so many questions that we have to that we have to go through here now. So tell me about the book. So this is um, a young adult book from a boy's point of view, and he's a wrestler. How did you, what made you decide to write about wrestling, about a gay? Uh, teenager, how did this book come to be? Tell me, tell me some of the background of how you how you came to write the book. I wanted to write a book um, about a farm kid, for one thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I wanted to write a book about a kid who hates school. Yeah. Um, Common. And as I started thinking about 
what I, you know, what I would put into the book, how I would uh, grow the character, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, it was around 2014, 2015. Okay. And if you think back, that was about the time that um, there was quite a lot of controversy in Alberta about gay straight alliances. Mm -hmm. I remember. And, um, you know, there were, there was quite a lot of rhetoric um, mm -hmm. tossed around uh, and there were some fairly nasty things that were being said. Mm -hmm. And one thing that really struck me, um, some of the comments against gay straight alliances or GSAs, mm -hmm. when you parse them down to what the person was actually saying, it, it basically boiled down to, well, we don't need those where we are because we don't have any queer kids. Mm -hmm. And I'm using queer in the, the umbrella term sense. Yeah. Um, so LGBTQ plus the Q, some people think it's questioning, some people think it's queer. I'm just saying queer in the sense of all of those letters and, mm -hmm. and more. Yeah. Um, and that, it really made me mad because I went to school, um, to high school in a small town. We lived on a farm. Mm -hmm. Much like I lived in a, a rural place. I went to university that picked up quite a few kids from the rural area. And I'm here mm -hmm. to tell you, queer kids are everywhere. Mm -hmm. They seriously are. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm thinking about the character for the book I wanted to write, I thought, yeah, you know, I'll make this a gay farm kid. Um, yeah. And um, and the kid hates school. The only reason he can stand the, to be there sports. And I thought wrestling seemed like a good sport for him to do. Mm -hmm. it, it That's something that I, what you said there is something that I felt in the book because it was based in more of a, there was a, it was a farm boy who wasn't all of the cliche, um, all of the things that have been sort of, stereotyped about about a boy like that so that's what i thought was really well done too was you brought in he and you brought in that he lived in like a rural town there was other gay kids around him it was it wasn't a it was a it was a deal it wasn't a big deal but it was a deal for him right because there was there was other you tell me but from what i got it there was other gay boys around him so it wasn't um it was it reminded me of um of the, the book um love simon where his sexuality is he's comfortable with it but he right. wants to make the choice about when he comes out so i thought that was really well done and i thought that came across really well so so the the boy point of view was because this was something you felt passionate about and that's the reason that you chose to write from a boy from a boy's perspective how did you get into that headspace of a teen boy what did you like how did you do did you talk to people or you're are you a librarian or, or you were a librarian are you around young people how did um, you get in there honestly um i i sort of because gunner is um a farm kid and he loves horses and he's mm -hmm. all into nature and he doesn't like social media and so Quite, so for a lot of that, I just channeled myself in high school, honestly, okay. just yep. because I was one of those kids too. You know, I would come home, get off the bus, and go find the cows. You know, yep. so that part of him is quite a lot of my own upbringing. Okay, um, that, it was very authentic. I really felt like I never felt at any point that that uh, I, I thought your voice was really strong. And I never felt at any point that it wasn't a boy that I was reading about. So I think you you channeled him very well. And I did notice the social media that he didn't like it. And then his friends around him, I thought that was well done too, because it was something that he didn't have to be as a character always on his phone. So that was good. And kind, But it was good because it also showed um, another side of, of teens because not all teens are like that. So I thought that was really done. Well done. So as far as the book you said you started around 2014 or were you just talking about what happened in 2000 when did you start writing it tell us a little bit about how did you come to be published and who your publisher is tell us a little bit about that um so 
you kind of have to go back to 2013 when I quit my job at the end of the year. Okay, um, that'll that'll be a good one. <laughs> yeah, and um, so I was sort of casting about, and um, my husband said, "Well, you know, why don't you go ahead and start writing the book that you want to write, and you know, don't worry about job hunting for the moment." So I thought, okay, that might be a good plan, and um, <clears throat> I at that time. Uh, the Writers Guild has a mentorship program. Yep. And I had written plays and various other things, but never um, book length not, uh, fiction. Mm -hmm. So I applied to the mentorship program and I was accepted. And Kim McCullough was my mentor at the time. She has written Young Adult and right. that was what I wanted to write. So that worked out well. And I came out of that program in very early 2015 with a full manuscript, Great. which was nowhere near um, ready to go, you know. Mm -hmm. So for the next several years, up until last year, um, I was writing, editing. Um, there were times I would drop it for six or eight months, just, you know, I, I had another job in that time period um, as a technical writer. So, you know, there were several times where I just needed to set it aside um, and let it gel in my head. So I would, I would think it would be hard and that's, this is just me, but to write as a technical writer and then to go, did you find it hard to go back to fiction or was it soothing to go back to fiction after writing um, for your other job? It, it's very hard to um, do technical writing and still feel creative at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. um, that job only lasted a year, thank goodness I okay. left it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I still manage to be productive. It's just harder. Yeah. I think like sure. anybody that works full time and tries to write, it's- It's, it's tough, for sure. Tough. So as far as getting published, did you did you have an agent? Did you query? How did that process work? So when I had the manuscript about where I thought it needed to be, mm -hmm. um, and I I actually um, I pitched it too early, knowing it was too early, and then went back, did a lot more writing, rewriting, editing, and the, the second time around, I felt like it was really ready so um okay i um it's kind of a long story i will um condense it down to i got an agent stacy conla here in calgary uh -huh. um she sent it out and dancing cat books um wanted to publish it so okay that's basically what happened is that who you're published with though um, it's DCB Dancing Cat Books, which is an okay. imprint of Cormorant. Okay, because that's I. Okay, that makes more sense. So, so your agent, your agent pitched it and sold it for you. Yes. Awesome. Well, that that uh, congratulations. That's so wonderful. And it came out in April. April eleventh. Yes. And how have what what how has the um, how is the um, publishing world? What what do you love about having your book out there? What what do you wish that you had known or what could you do differently? Is there anything that you would offer some advice to other writers about um, their first book, I guess? I probably should have been a lot more media savvy. So I would mm -hmm. say um, get a better website than mine. That's uh, a tough one though. Like <laughs> the, the whole media side of it is a tough one, right? And for yes. some people it comes really naturally and I, I know when, when I had books come out, I struggle with that as well. And it's it's hard, right? It's um, it's especially I, hard right now because if, yeah. if you get on social media at all, you're instantly in this whirlpool of awfulness. Yeah, it's true. Stuff. It's true. It's true. And that's, a, that's another thing I was going to ask you about. But that is true because you actually debuted during, like right when COVID would have been starting. That would have been tough, yeah. For sure. Some of the excitement that you had of like walking into a bookstore and holding your book, you didn't get to experience, but you oh, wow. still, I mean, it's out there and it's published and it's something to yeah. be really proud of. It's a great book. You've done a great job. I hope lots of people 
pick it up and read it because I think there's something there for for uh, boys, for girls, straight, gay, yeah. whatever, right? There's a lot of really good themes that run throughout the book and there's a lot of really good characterization. There's a lot of, a lot of things that people um, young, my age, <laughs> teenagers will relate to. So I hope they get out and read it. But as far as um, writing now, in have you been writing some are you working on something new have you been able to write during covid it's it's tough no i literally if you know if i turn on the computer to work and the message pops up you know another really horrible thing has happened mm -hmm. and the world is about to you know go down the toilet mm -hmm. um so i have been trying in the last few weeks to kind of really wean myself off and and get to a calmer place so that I really can get back to writing. I have, I use Scrivener writing software. I've got okay. three different projects out of probably 10 potential projects. I have three, each one I thought, okay, this is definitely the book I'm writing next. Mm -hmm. um, I get about 10,000, 20,000 words in it. Oh, this is not the, I can't do this. I'll try the next book. And so I've basically accomplished nothing. Well, um, if you're, if you're yeah. still, I think a lot of people are struggling with creativity in this time, but if the fact that you're writing and you're trying, that's a part of it. Um, are the other books that you're working on young adult as well? I have one adult, one young adult, and one middle grade that okay, so each you of are... which I started and then kind of set aside. Um, okay. I now have a slightly different young adult project in mind um, okay, that I think I'm going to tackle. The problem is when you're envisioning something new at this time, you realize, well, you have this big choice. Do I put the pandemic in it or not? And if I do put the pandemic in it, what's the world going to look like a year from now when this book might be done? And absolutely, you know, you have, I'm very tempted to just pretend like the pandemic isn't there, but you know, it's hard to do that, yeah. Depending on what the book is about, you may, yeah. you know, which is why I think a lot of people are suddenly writing science fiction or mm -hmm. historical fiction. You know what, that's a really good point because your books are contemporary, right? And it is a choice now. Is it is it pre-COVID, is it during COVID, or is it the world that we don't even know what that looks like? Right. Yet? So, yeah, it's a tough one. Um, as far as your writing process itself, in a normal world, we'll, we'll pretend that we are working, living in a different world. We're in a sci-fi adventure. But how do you normally write? Do you write, do you have like goals that you set for yourself a day? Are you a pantser? Are you a plotter? How, what is your What does your writing world look like? Do you plan before you I write? Try or? I try okay. to. <laughs> outline, are you an outliner? Um, an outline? I try to. Um, I, if I have a project and I know where I'm going, or, you know, I, I do try to outline, uh, like, you know, every, probably most people you get started and suddenly everything starts changing. Yeah. Um, I will, I don't write every day, uh, unless I have a deadline. If, if I know something's coming up, then suddenly I can start writing every day. Deadlines are really wonderful for that. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm all over the place. So okay. I wish I could be one of those people that was, you know, behind in the seat at eight o'clock, eight to 12, eat lunch, one to five. I haven't really managed that. Unless I don't know. I don't know how many writers actually do. I have to say when I was reading your work, because, because it's, because it's so, um, the characterization is so strong. Um, to me, and I, I am a, a, a pantser. I don't, I, I try to do the outlines and, and like what you're saying, but to me, your book read very much like you, um, not, not because in a way that is a compliment to me, it was um, the pantser style where it's very deep characterization. Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah, and to me, and that's why I wanted to know if that was something you do. So you, I think you kind of answered. <laughs> I think this was, this particular book, probably you could say it was seat of the pants, you know, okay. very, few, very few, there were a few moments that I knew this one thing will happen, but yeah, 
Um, it was very character driven. That's what I found. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Character driven. There was still a lot of really good plot there and a lot of good like um, atmosphere and scenery and the rest of it. But to me, it's a very strong character driven novel. And that's what I, I really enjoyed about it. I thought you're the voice. Um, nailing the young adult voice is sometimes hard, but I think you did a really good job. Especially boys. It's hard. It's hard to write a, a boy point of view. So. Well then, um, we were when we were talking a bit about the book itself. Um, I was looking at um, there was a few things in there that 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 jumped out at me and some phrases that I really loved. One that I picked up was, "He burned off fat like Dad's big farm truck burns gas." <laughs> I just thought that was really well done. And I wondered for you, have you got some favorite parts of the book? Like, was there a favorite part that you loved to write? And was there a, a certain part where maybe you struggled? Let's go to the, the favorite part first. Um, <clears throat> I There were a few scenes I loved. I loved doing the day in June. Um, I loved doing, uh, there's, a, there's a scene in the building construction class. Um, yep. After Gunner comes out, or is outed actually, uh, where one of the students jumps in to sort of help him. And I, I enjoyed that scene quite a lot. Okay. okay. Um, what do you think, I'm just gonna skip to another thing. What do you think as far as like, we, we, you read the first chapter, what would you, how would you describe the book if you were talking to people about it? And what, what do you hope that they get from the book? You talked a little bit about that with the way that you grew up and the LGBTQT community, but what do you what what kind of messages do you hope that people get from your book? Um, I think, well, one thing that I had in mind, I really wanted to write a book that kids who hate to read would actually like to yeah. read. So yeah. that was I was hoping that it would hold people's interest and in, you know that actual teenagers would like it. Yeah, See, I'm um, not an actual teenager, but I read teenage books and I think you pulled it off. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I think I just, like I was saying at the beginning, just I wanna make the point that, um, you know, queer kids are everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. They don't necessarily match what you've got in your mind as yeah. what a queer kid is. Mm -hmm. um, and many of them don't have support. And I tried to show that, others mm -hmm. do. And you um, showed that as well, yeah. And so I, yeah, I, I wanted a book that was a, I thought, I wanted to show people that I think are realistic and that I think these kinds of people are here in Alberta. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to tell the story, um, hopefully in an entertaining way. Um, mm -hmm that maybe a few people who haven't thought about it in this way might see things differently. Yeah, in a no, I hope. I think, no, I, I know what you mean exactly. So going back to the favorite scene, we had talked a little bit about, um, about a favorite scene and I think this would be a good time for you to maybe okay. read one of your, maybe give us a little summary of what what is going on because this is further on in the book and where we're at so we get an image and then you can read it. Okay, um, <clears throat> Gunner is in his building construction class. Um, he has been outed. So this is his first day at school back. Um, and in the class, um, Eric Stetley is his working bench partner. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Gilkey is the teacher. And Rodden James is the older brother of Gunner's really good friend, Becca James. Okay. And um, Rodden is actually a year older than Becca, but he's going through 12th or grade 12 the second time um, for reasons not really his fault, but that's a different book. <laughs> um, okay. Building construction. Eric steadily glared at me, arms folded, and made no move to set up his workspace. 
Problem, Mr. Stetley? Mr. Gilkey paused, clipboard in one arm. Eric scowled. I want to work at another table. As you can see, said Mr. Gilkey, we don't have any open spots. The class is full. You've been working at that table all semester. What's the problem? By now, everyone in the class had paused to watch. Eric wasn't going to say that he didn't want to work with the fag because that would get him in trouble. Mr. Gilkey stared at Eric. Eric glared at me, stalemate. Switch places with me, dickwad. Rod and James paced over, carrying a plastic bin that contained his project in progress. Eric, affronted, turned to walk away, mumbling something really rude about me and Rodden. Rodden brought the room to a dead stop. No one could miss his words. Eric, you're welcome. Did you see Gunner's date at the festival? Pulling guys like that, what would he want with your pimply butt? I think your virtue is safe. Then, not so loud, asshole. Most students in the room laughed, a few looked scandalized, and Mr. Gilkey had a convenient moment of hearing loss. Mum says that sometimes good teaching is knowing what not to see or hear. She doesn't mean not hearing what you should hear. I nodded at Rodden, meaning thanks, and he jerked his chin up to acknowledge. He didn't say anything else, and we both worked steadily until the bell. Awesome. The, something that that brings up for me is, is uh, something I hear often about in young adult books is often the parents aren't really present in the book, but I did like that in Under the Radar, um, the mom is, She's a teacher at the school that he goes to, and she's a, a big part of his life. Is that, was that intentional for you, to make the parents involved in the, in the story? Yes, yes very much. Um, it's, it's really hard writing adults, for me anyway, and young adult. Mm -hmm. um, like, you don't want them to be plastic, you know, yeah. or like Ken and Barbie parents. Mm -hmm. um, so, I wanted to show parents that were totally fine with their kid. Yeah, and were present too, because I think yes. in some young adult books, one way that authors kind of handle um, some of the some of the things that the the things that happen in the story is by just removing the parents from the story, and that that's okay. But I think it's good also to have, and especially in a story like this where. Um, a young person is kind of going through self-discovery or he, he, Gunner already knows who he is, but he's deciding right. how he's going to present this to the world at his, when he wants to, is his intention at, in the beginning. But um, it's good to have, to show um, parents being supportive too. I think that's something that is good for young adult and all, and it's hard to do, but I think that, I think that you did it well. Cause I know I've heard discussions with young adult authors where they just get rid of the parents because that's an easier way to um, to handle the book, and it works for it works for some books for sure. But sometimes it's nice to have a good parent in the in the book as well. So yeah, that was that was really done well well done as well. Um, is there is was there something in the book that was really hard for you to write, or that you found difficult, or that you had to put in, or Um, wow. Um, I'm thinking more of like the, the bullies and, and how uh, when they mistreat, yes. when they mistreat yes. Gunner. Was it uh, fun for you to go there or difficult or? It, it wasn't fun. I, and actually, um, you know, my editor, Barry Jowett at DCB, mm -hmm. um, had me do more work on the the biggest bully character in the book because it I I hadn't really gotten him as well rounded as I needed to. Okay. Um and I you know when I stepped back then I realized oh yeah um actually one of the scenes toward the very end is was what I did to 
make that character more well-rounded, um, mm -hmm. not 100% bad guy. In other words, um, okay. you know, human. Yeah. human, right. Like all characters need to be well-rounded. I had not yeah. wanted that with that character. Yeah. And I've heard people say that even the bullies and the bad guys don't think that they're the bad guy. And exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So like it's, it's good to show the, the all because we all think we're good people, but we all probably don't do good things. Not us, of course. But yes, no. Um, so as far as the um, your experience with DCB, are you writing another book for them? Is that was there an option in your contract for that? No, it's I'm a just, single book. It's a single book. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the next one I'm actually I'm um, very happy I'm not under any time pressure. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever I'm how doing. Long it, how long, like this book, it sounds like it took a few years to write. Is that like you had books, it said um, under your pseudonym, which I it's still a matter of. Oh, yeah. The, the word wrong. Those um, were my breaks too. I, I would get to a certain point on the young adult and novel and just set it over and write really? something else quick and fast. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. I always find other people's processes so interesting. So that was something that you would use when you were maybe stalled in your, yeah. uh, in the current book. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. So will you write romance again under this pen name or is? I don't know yet. Yeah. I, I have one of those Scrivener projects that's, you know, 20,000 words in is a romance, but, um, you know, like everything else in the pandemic right now, it's just stalled. So we'll it see. Yeah. When you say, when you talk about Scrivener, so how did you start using Scrivener? I don't use Scrivener and I am so envious of people who do. I have um, some good friends that, that use the program. How did you start using it? How did you get yourself into it? Um, I realized it would be really great to have one place to go for all of the notes, um, mm -hmm. links, pictures, maps, mm -hmm. you know, all the stuff that you accumulate when mm -hmm. you're doing a book and you've done research and you need to have it close at hand. Mm -hmm. um, and I even had lots and lots of notes that I jotted down on paper and character yeah. notes, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, the good thing about Scrivener, it's for me, it's not so much the ability to write in it, such as have every single thing that you need right there. Available to you. Tips. Yeah. I just have never been able to, to sit down. When you mentioned research, um, you mentioned maps and you mentioned pictures. Those are, every author has kind of their own way of doing things and keeping things and how they imagine things. Do you have a, a go-to book or some books that you that you really use when you're writing novels or that have helped you along the way to get published? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, part of doing this book was learning how to write mm -hmm. long form fiction. That That's probably why it took so long. Did you say uh, this was the first, yeah, this was the first long book that you, like novel that you completed? Except for the a fiction. really oh. terrible novel I wrote right after university. Um, it was so bad, I shredded it. <laughs> don't want anybody ever to see it. Uh, we I all have a book like that, yeah. Yeah, and the first play I wrote also, Shredder. Um, but yeah, th this was the first real long form fiction piece that oh. I'd written. So, That's um, excellent. so I was kind of figuring out how I could or would do it. That, yeah. that was part of it. Um, I, I like to read craft books. Um, I would say it's not a craft book, but it's the book I read when I feel like I'm a fraud and I can't do this anymore. You know, I need something to read to lift my spirits. I will read Annie Dillard, The Writing Life. Okay. Yeah. And I haven't read that, but I've heard of it. So yeah. yeah. Interesting. If you need a boost, you need a reason to go sit down at the computer. That is a good place to go. 
Okay, I'm going to go to that place because right now I think I need it too. Well, we are getting close to the end. That went by fast. There's still um, more that I'd love to ask you. Have you got a, a website where you would like you, people can go visit, learn more about you and your books? Maybe tell us um, what that is. It's all one word, judithclarkauthor.com. And on that website, there is a link to my Twitter and a link to my Facebook. I am, I do some posting. I'm not a huge social media person, but um, you know, I post occasionally on Facebook, any event that I might be oh. doing. Okay. Well, I'm going to check that out and I hope that we can meet in person sometime and yes. talk a little bit more about writing and your books. But thank you so much for um, reading your novel. I, I think it's a wonderful young adult novel that um, adults would enjoy just as much. Um, everyone's been a teenager at some point in their lives. Well, will be a teenager <laughs> or have been. <laughs> so yeah, very well done. Um, I just wanted to add as well that there is another um, uh, recorded interview coming up on Friday, July 17th at seven o'clock. It is D.A. Vandenbrink and the book is The Crimson Dimension. So we will be um, seeing that come up on YouTube as well. And thank you so much, Judith. And I wish you all the luck with your book and moving forward. We hope to see lots more from you. Thank you, Janet. Thanks, Thanks very much. Okay.